Welcome to Health IQ. I'm Dr. Alan Siegel. Today we have a special guest, Dr. Pooja Shaw. She's with Foot and Ankle Surgeons of New York in Valhalla. Welcome, Dr. Shaw. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, as a podiatric surgeon, you see a lot of foot and ankle injuries. Obviously, that's your specialty. Uh, what are some of the more common injuries that you see in your practice uh, for our viewers? So I would say the most common the injury that probably walks into our office is usually an ankle sprain. Um, there's a lot of people that are either running or just working out at home or just walking outside, walking their dog, and they tend to see this uneven curb and they kind of twist their ankle and then they kind of come into our office. Some people come in usually the day after or some people usually wait a week or two weeks after and they're saying, hey doc, like I did this to my ankle a couple weeks ago, it's still hurting, what do I do? So what we usually do with that, there's kind of a whole spectrum of for ankle sprains. So it can be anything from just a small little sprain, we kind of have to rest it, ice it, let the inflammation calm down and they're good to go. Other ones are a little more complicated. We have to put them in a brace, give them proper physical therapy or rehab, and it takes a little bit longer for us to kind of go about that. Well, when you're evaluating the ankle sprain, you know, a lot of times people don't know, oh, did I fracture it? Did I uh, rupture a tendon? Did I just sprain the ligament? There's a lot of, like you said, variations, you know, of that ankle sprain. Some people don't even know, you know, if they had a significant injury or not, and, you know, based on the swelling or whatever. Do you recommend, you know, usually getting an x-ray or some kind of diagnostic just to rule out some of the other things and make sure it's not, you know, something more significant? Right. So usually when somebody comes in with an ankle sprain, my protocol for anybody is usually to get an x-ray for the same reasons that you said. So it is common to have associated fractures with an ankle sprain. So the most common fractures I would probably say in an ankle sprain are usually around here, which is a fifth metatarsal, which is on the side of your foot. Some people can kind of chip off a bone. Other times you can chip off something called the calcaneus, which is otherwise known as a heel bone. Some people can also chip off a piece of that because of the ankle ligaments that are attached to it. And in more severe cases, you can actually get a full-blown ankle fracture, in which case either the fibula or the tibia, which are the two bones that make up the ankle joint, can also get fractured. Okay. I had a personal experience with this because uh, my son was playing basketball and you know, at the end of the season last year, he came down his ankle, he rolled his ankle, oh, no. You know, it was right before his next season. It was at the end of basketball, and we're like, well, maybe it's just a sprain. A couple of weeks, he'll be okay. And then he said, you know, I think I heard something. Oh, no. Like, so then we're like, okay, we need to get an x-ray. Because if you hear a crack or hear or you feel something that may be more significant, the x-ray is important. So he actually ended up did having the avulsion fracture of the distal um, uh, fibula. And right. uh, so he was in a boot for you know a few weeks. A weeks. <laughs> right, yeah. so an x-ray, we do it in the office right then and there. So we can evaluate right then and there what kind of trajectory this injury will have. So if we can see the fracture right then and there, we will tell the patients most commonly they are in a boot, like you said, like your son, for a couple of weeks. If it's a little more severe fracture, like an ankle fracture or something more involved, we may have to either operate on it or put them in a cast or a more immobilizing kind of boot for about closer to six weeks. If we look at the x-ray that we do in the office and we see that there's nothing wrong, but we still feel like there might be something else going on, maybe like you said, a tendon injury or a rupture of a ligament, we can do an ultrasound also that we do it right there in the office. So an ultrasound is very useful because it gives us information that we normally wouldn't get with an x-ray. So ultrasound will tell us maybe there's an Achilles tendon rupture that's associated with it or the anterior talofibular ligament, which is the most common ligament that's sprained in an ankle, or the calcaneofibular ligament, which is also another common ankle sprain. Another tendon is a peroneal tendon, which is usually on the side. It goes right here behind the fibula, and it kind of attaches to the bottom of the fifth metatarsal, which sometimes can get injured as well in an ankle sprain, which is usually what causes that avulsion fracture of the fifth metatarsal that we were talking about. You mentioned that ultrasound, which I think is interesting because I don't think a lot of our viewers recognize the advancements in diagnostic right. ultrasound. You know, everyone's so used to the standard MRI protocol Correct. of trying to evaluate soft tissue and tendons and ligaments. Uh, but there's a great tool that's come a long way in the last you know, five to 10 mm -hmm. years in terms of high resolution diagnostic ultrasound, which practitioners like yourself right. can use in the office and get a quicker, pretty definitive diagnosis. Now, you may still decide to get the MRI at some Correct. point based on that ultrasound, but it's a, it's a very good in-office tool that lets you say, hey, you know, I see something here, let's move to the next step, get the MRI, confirm everything. But you know, based on what I'm seeing, at right. least we know what the diagnosis is, versus having to wait a week or two sometimes 
to Correct. get an MRI to know what's going on. Right, exactly. So the ultrasound kind of gives the patient a better trajectory of what to expect with the injury. Like a lot of the athletes want to get back up on their feet as soon as possible. And sometimes the ultrasound will let us confirm that they indeed can do that if there's nothing wrong. But sometimes if we see something a little off or something a little questionable on the ultrasound, we will still get the MRI, like you said. But it also mentally prepares the patient that, hey, it might take a little bit longer than what you were anticipating to get back up on your feet. And that's an important conversation to have with the patients so they yeah. can get back to their original activity that they wanted to have. Yeah, we, we send a lot of our athletes and, and people that just right. want a, a quick evaluation of what's going on for diagnostic ultrasound for right. the foot and ankle, even other body parts, knees, you know, shoulders, sure. uh, hips and everything. So it's been a very useful tool. So I think that's important for uh, uh, our viewers to know, practitioners that are using that in their, in their office, especially if they want that information a little bit quicker right. versus having to get an authorization for an MRI and all these other, yep. other things. So. so it does become a little bit more difficult. Sometimes in the acute setting, if they just walk in, MRIs can be done a little bit quicker if they say, hey, we think there's a tendon rupture or something like that. But the ultrasounds are also kind of used for when patients have a more chronic ankle sprain. They've had it for a couple months, the pain is lingering, and we also use the ultrasounds for something called an ultrasound guided injection, where we kind of visualize a joint or the tendon or any other area that we're kind of looking for, and then we can inject accordingly and make sure we're not hitting mm -hmm. anything that we don't want to hit with the injection. Okay, excellent. Well, as you know, the foot and ankle has like a lot of bones, a lot of a lot ligaments, of a lot of tendons. It's a very complex structure of our body, and a lot can go wrong. Now, an ankle okay. injury is surely a traumatic injury or some mm -hmm. kind of like trauma or misstep or whatever you want to call it. It usually just wouldn't occur spontaneously, but there's other things that start to occur, um, sort of like insidious or not really known uh, causes, uh, or sometimes there are known causes and sure. sometimes we can prevent things, but you hear a lot of the term plantar fasciitis. So right. what is plantar fasciitis and you know how does it occur? How can we prevent it from happening in the first place? And then yeah. if someone does get it, what is the protocol for that? So plantar fasciitis is another common thing that we do see in the office quite frequently. So most of our patients that come in with plantar fasciitis, they usually come in with this like aching heel pain. So most patients most commonly will come in with that pain directly first step in the morning. They say, hey doc, I'm getting out of the bed in the morning and I just can't put my foot on the ground. It's usually located right here on the bottom of the heel. Um, that's where the plantar fascia starts. It's a uh, fascia, which is basically connective tissue. It starts on the heel and it kind of goes all the way up to the forefoot. So when that becomes really tight and inflamed, that's usually when the patients start getting that pain. And where would they feel the pain? Is it only in the heel? Or do they start to feel it down the, down the forefoot as well? Or, or is it mostly in the calcaneal area? Sure, so most commonly patients do feel it in the heel area, okay. more so on the inside of the foot. I'm gonna flip it around. More so on the inside of the foot, that medial calcaneal tubercle, which is basically where it starts, is usually where most people have that pain. However, a lot of patients do kind of feel it all throughout the arch and sometimes even in the toes as well. Okay, and then treatment for that would be what, and, you know, what do we discuss what causes that or what, what so can cause that? So plantar fasciitis usually for most people is dependent on their foot type. Okay. So people with higher yeah. arch foot, that it's usually pulled a little tighter in those patients. So those patients are more prone to getting it. That's not to say that patients that have flatter type feet are not going to get it. Another common etiology of plantar fasciitis are people that have very, very tight calf muscles. So the plantar fascia is on, located on the bottom of the foot that we said previously, and it kind of connects with your uh, calf muscle tendon at the back of the heel. So when your calf muscle is really tight, right on that bottom of the heel, it kind of gets inflamed. And we really recommend that the most, the best way to treat it is to do stretches. Okay. So, so rehab therapy. Yep, stretches, rehab yeah. therapy. Usually we go right. over home stretches that they can do. We also have night splints that we can dispense in the office, which are basically a a splint that they can wear overnight. It kind of puts their foot at a 90 degree angle and it helps to passively stretch that calf muscle. Sometimes patients don't really like wearing something overnight. So what we usually like to say is if you're at least at home eating dinner, watching a movie for a couple hours, at least you can have it on for that time. So you don't have to constantly think about stretching it. You can just passively stretch that tendon. Now what about uh, something that's a little chronic, getting a little bit difficult to treat or pain do you, I mean, there's, you know, not controversy, but you know, I think doctors and, and, and medicine in general are starting to get away from steroid injections sure. in terms of like, 
you know, on a chronic uh, basis or re repetitive basis because it degrades tissue and all right. that. So would that be something that would be even indicated for a patient here or, you know, uh, other uh, means like orthotics uh, down the road to prevent it from coming back or? Sure. So for people that have plantar fasciitis, obviously stretching is a great treatment, but there's sometimes pain that we just can't tend to, you know, alleviate. So what I usually recommend is either prescription um, NSAIDs, which are basically anti-inflammatory medications that can help kind of calm down that inflammation. And injection is also a great tool that we do use. Like you said, repetitive steroid injections are not great in the heel, especially the skin is very thin on the bottom of the foot. You can cause thinning of the skin. You can cause injuries to plantar fascia that you don't want to obviously per perpetuate the problem. But I do think steroid injections in limits are a good tool to use. And especially, like I said previously, with that ultrasound, we can kind of perfectly inject in that area that we need to. We can also rule out that there, there's no tears already there. So if we do an ultrasound and we see that there's already a tear present, we probably won't inject that area. And in your experience, you know, have, have you started to work with like uh, PRP for certain types of injuries, either like this or Achilles tendonitis? Sure. Um, I know it's not you know, maybe a standard protocol in the medical community, but it's becoming more commonplace. Mm -hmm. um, you know, more research comes out and, uh, you know, right. so are you guys using any of those uh, procedures in your offices or, or not quite yet? So PRP, we are using it in the okay. office. Um, we tend to see that the most success with that kind of treatment plan is more so with our soft tissue injuries. So something like a plantar fasciitis or an Achilles insertional tendonitis, which is basically when the tendon inserts directly on that heel bone. We can't really inject a steroid near the Achilles tendon because there's a high chance of rupture, so we tend to stay away from that. So with the PRP, it kind of gives us an alternative <coughs> for a patient that doesn't necessarily want to do something surgical or so doesn't want to do something more invasive. It's kind of a less invasive alternative treatment that we can offer patients in our office. Okay, so mo most plantar fasciitis is treatable and there's usually a good prognosis for patients as long as they follow the doctor's instructions right. and do their stretches and hopefully you know, see their therapist if they need to and, and keep it. And then you know, proper footwear is probably very important, I would think, uh, just in terms of a lot of you know, right. foot and ankle you know, uh, injuries and, and problems that you see and things that they may cause. And, you know, uh, we haven't spoken about the good old bunion yet, right? So if right. you want to discuss the bunion, because I know sure. that's probably a very common right. injury with it people. It is a and, common thing. And uh, how, how do people prevent it? And, and if they do get them, you know, how to help with, you know, the pain and discomfort, you know, before it becomes a surgical case or something of that sure. nature. Sure. So I guess I can just segue easily into it. Um, going back to the heel pain for a little bit, I forgot to mention that there are, once we do kind of get that pain alleviated and we want to let the patient know they're kind of prone to this, so we do tell them to potentially get a pair of orthotics, okay. which we can also possibly do in the office. We can scan them right in the office. We have a new iPad scanner that we can do. It's no messy cast or anything yeah. like that <laughs> that the patients do tend to like. So that will also help them with a little bit of heel cushion in the actual shoe gear that they're wearing. Right. Um, so that'll help it from basically getting re-injured or maybe causing another flare-up of that plantar fasciitis. Yeah. Directly going from the orthotics for the plantar fasciitis, we can also yeah. do orthotics for bunions. Right. So bunions is a common thing. It's a common thing that people are aware of. They always think of like, hey, my grandmother or my grandfather used to get them in the elder population. But it's becoming more and more common and becoming more and more prevalent in the younger population. They want to get it treated as well. Yeah. A bunion is basically when the first toe kind of starts drifting towards the second toe. So the, toe, the first toe starts drifting towards the second toe, and then this part, which is a metatarsal, kind of starts sticking out. And that's kind of that bump that you feel in the shoe. A lot of people, when they're wearing tighter shoes, that area becomes red and it becomes inflamed, which is when it starts to bother So them. it's really just a separation of the joints uh, in that area and one's going this way, one's going the yep. other way, and it causes like that bulge. It's not, there's no calcium deposits per se, or, or you know, it's just uh, the, kind of like the, the misdirection right. of that joint. It's the misdirection yeah. of that joint. And the it's flaring of the joint, so to correct. speak. Correct, yeah. and it's usually because of a certain type of foot type. Okay. Uh, bunions are very, uh, they are genetic. There is a predisposition to them. They run in the family. Yeah. If your mother or father or anybody else in your family, you have a higher guilty. chance. Guilty, guilty. <laughs> <laughs> you have a higher so, chance of getting them, yeah. so it is better to get it evaluated, especially yeah. if you're a younger patient and you think that there is something that is forming. It's always best to get it involved, yeah. be best to get it checked out. The reason for that, we would evaluate it with x-rays and to make sure that there's no early signs of arthritis. 
So there are different kinds of bunions and there are many various different treatment plans. But the first thing is to kind of decide why you're forming a bunion in the first place. Right. Some people have a flatter foot, so that's why they're predisposed to the bunions in general. Some people, it could be a congenital issue where they've had it since they were young. And that be, they could be very hypermobile in that area, in which case the treatment plan for that patient would be a little different than the treatment plan for someone maybe who's a little bit elderly with an arthritic joint. Yeah, I think it's important, you know, with the orthotics uh, to get back to that. Uh, sure. You know, I personally have been wearing orthotics since I think I'm 12 years old. So, you know, just like you said, genetics, poor feet. Uh, as a young athlete, I had, you know, I think it's Severs, is that my pronounce yes. Severs disease? So, so that really was a big correction for me to help with the heel pain, the bunions over time. I also think, you know, again, proper shoe wear, footwear. Uh, helps, you know, you may not be able to prevent the bunion from occurring, but if you're wearing things that are complicating the bunion, okay, right. ski boots in particular, <laughs> yes. can be extremely painful for people Correct. with wide feet and yes. bunions. So um, you're just explaining to your patients, uh, you know, make sure you're, you're wearing the proper footwear, get proper footwear appropriate for your shoes. I know it's more difficult for the ladies sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. versus the men to get like a wider shoe right. or you know an extra wide four foot shoe or whatever and then even with the orthotics finding shoes that you know women versus men can put into their shoes right. that they still want to wear um, you know where you recommend you know flat wear or heel wear or a combination of both depending on what is going on with that foot and ankle for that patient so. right so usually with the orthotics kind of going back to that we tell people with bunion deformities like this is a progressive disease, so it can get worse over time, especially for our younger patients. So some patients, we tell them you can kind of watch it, or we can kind of <clears throat> in, intervene surgically. There's obviously a spectrum, each patient is different, so we have to kind of take their whole story into play before we kind of jump to surgery. So we do tell them that orthotics can kind of prevent the progression of it. It won't remove the bunion, unfortunately. We can't undo what's already been done. However, it will prevent it from progressing faster into maybe potentially an arthritic joint. So like you said, for men, um, we do recommend loafers if they have to go to work and wear a dressier shoe because they tend to have a little bit more space in the toe box. For women who have to dress up, again, there are loafers out there that are a little wider, um, but unfortunately, like shoes like heels and things like that will probably irritate it. It is kind of a misconception that women that wear heels all the time are going to get a bunion because they wear heels all the time. Right. It is yeah. a little, <laughs> it's a little bit of an old wives tale because yeah. it's usually not the case that if you jam your foot into a, a heel is probably not the reason you had the bunion. Right. It will probably perpetuate the problem. It will probably be uncomfortable for you. Right. However, people should know that it is more genetic and it's more based on the type of foot that you have. Yeah. But so try and find some footwear that surely is comfortable. And, and uh, you know, when you're working with like your, your running population mm -hmm. or, you know, even jogging or, or, you know, any really athletic population, you know, going through like proper footwear, uh, there's been so much advanced technology in, in, in running shoes and in, uh, you know, just basketball shoes, you know, pickleball or tennis or whatever's going on these days. Um, you know, how important is that to just make sure they're wearing a quality, you know, shoe for what, what they're, what they're wearing, you know, so what they're you, doing, basically. Right. So, I mean, I think anybody that plays a sport or is it active in any which way, even at the gym or at home, it's definitely important to have good shoe gear. So that is a very common conversation that I have with a lot of my patients, depending on their activity level. I do talk about their shoe gear. So something that I usually tell most of my patients is that the best kind of shoe is something that has a good support system. So those shoes that tend to be a little flatter, those canvas type shoes are probably not supporting most people's foot type. They're not good for most people. Right. People that are active need good support on their shoe and they also need to be kind of be able to move quickly if they're running or playing a sport. So I like to say have a good heel cushion because that'll support it when your foot first hits the ground at heel strike and then it'll kind of let you accelerate forward, especially yeah. for the runners. Sometimes what's it called, the front of the shoe, you'll see a little flare of the shoe kind of come up, yes, and then that'll help you kind of accelerate forward. I noticed they started doing that with basketball shoes, right. which I wasn't even accustomed to. And I put on the shoe, I felt like I was rocking, rocking in them, and I was like, "This is this is different for me." I having so I had to get used to those for a little bit, but uh, it did seem to help the uh, the heel toe action a little bit. So right. it was interesting. So basketball shoes, like you mentioned, they're kind of very different from the running shoes. The yes. running shoes that they have a nice heel cushion, they kind of want you to accelerate. Basketball shoes are pretty flat on the bottom. Yeah. But a good thing about basketball shoes is that they kind of go above the ankle. 
So it's very important for people that are doing basketball or sports like that. There's a lot of jumping action and it kind of protects that ankle because a lot of these athletes are prone to injuries or they've had injuries in the past. And we want to kind of protect that area before it gets injured even further. Now, in terms of uh, other uh, common injuries, I, I've heard, you know, about hammer toes that don't seem so pleasant and, and friendly at times. Right. You know, how do people, you know, develop those? Are those also genetic? Uh, are those typically surgical and then like, uh, you know, painful neuromas, people hear those words as well. Sure. <laughs> what, what about those kind so of let's, conditions? So let's dive into the hammer toes. So the hammer toes and bunions usually yeah. kind of get grouped into one big group because right. everyone's like, well, I have a bunion, I also have a hammer toe. They're actually two very different things. The bunion, like we said, is for the big toe, the great toe. The hammer toes are kind of more in the smaller digits. They're usually when, instead of having a straight toe like that, they tend to bend a little bit and then they kind of hit you in the shoe. So they are genetic sometimes. A lot of diabetics do form them because of the way that diabetes affects the muscles in your feet. It's very common in those kind of patients. Those kind of patients you have to be especially careful when they do develop a hammer toe because with diabetes can come circulation problems and something called neuropathy where the nerves in the toes don't exactly work the best that we would like them to. So when they develop a hammer toe, they can potentially form a blister which can turn into an ulcer in their shoe with the diabetics. So we tend to watch those patients especially carefully and we kind of decide if it's important to intervene surgically with them to make sure that they don't recur or we tend to try to get them these diabetic shoes that gives them a lot of room in the shoe so that it doesn't prevent those ulcers or things like that. For patients that are not diabetics, hammer toes tend to be something that we can treat conservatively like once again with shoe gear where we tell them to wear a sneaker or something that's a little bit more room where the toes are. However, there can be arthritis in the smaller joints of the foot of the toes as well. So at that point, we would kind of weigh the options and offer surgery to the patients and see if they're appropriate candidate. Okay, very good. Uh, and the neuroma. Right. <laughs> the painful neuroma. Let's, so let's finalize painful, that one. <laughs> sure. So the neuroma is something that is probably one of something that is very commonly seen or people hear about it on TV or from their colleagues and they're not really sure what it is. So people kind of get this like generalized foot pain and they're, they can't really pinpoint where. Sometimes it's in the second toe, it's in the fourth toe, they say it jumps around or they get like the shooting electric kind of pain and that's usually when it's a neuroma. So a neuroma by definition is an inflammation of the nerve. So there are nerves that run in between all of the metatarsals right here and if one of those nerves become inflamed, it could potentially become a neuroma. Some people can have a neuroma their whole life and never know about it and be very well. Some people, unfortunately, when they become a little more inflamed and the size is a little bit more prominent, is usually when they start feeling the symptoms. So what do we do for that? So there is something called a metatarsal pad, which we can place in the shoe itself to kind of spread out the metatarsals themselves to kind of take off a little bit of the pressure on the nerve. If that is something that they like and feel comfortable with, we can build a custom orthotic to kind of have that metatarsal pad and they can take it with them wherever they want and put it in all their shoes that they wear. If they- I have that. <laughs> it, I, I, that's my orth my sport orthotic. I have right. a pad in there to kind of prevent that, right. you know, constant the pressure, pressure on those four foot. Perfect. And it, it worked very well. So yeah, it that's, can prevent that. A lot of people do like that metatarsal yeah. pad because it does take off the pressure and it also helps in general with just like that achiness that you get in the front yeah. of your foot. And it prevents it from coming back if you stay active and everything. Exactly. So I think it's 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 a it's a positive thing for sure. Right. So there yeah. are treatments such as you can do a steroid injection because it is technically an inflammation of the nerve. Um, those tend to be I know people have different opinions on it, but I think in terms of treating the inflammation, it's a good uh, possible treatment plan. So you, again, you can't do repetitive steroid injections because again, the skin on the foot is very thin. It'll damage the surrounding tendons and things like that. Um, if a neuroma is something that we just can't seem to cut it with those conservative treatments, we can get further imaging, like an ultrasound or an MRI to kind of see how large it is. And if it's something that we feel that it's very large in size, it's going to be hard to treat with conservative options, then we do, we can surgically remove it. What do you think about uh, would like common NSAIDs or over the counter, you know, um, ibuprofens or you know Tylenols, that whatever? Would, would they be helpful in, in these conditions? Or so it depends on when the patient gets an aroma. It's kind of again dependent on their foot type. Yeah. It can help the same way a steroid would. It would take down the inflammation. But if we can't alleviate the pressure that's on the nerve, 
sometimes it's not really a permanent solution and we can't have patients taking NSAIDs for chronic periods of time for right. their stomach, obvious side effects, GI stomach issues, issues yeah. and GI issues, and it's, a, it's just not a solution. Sure. So in order to provide a solution, I think it's better to address the problem that's causing the neuroma, which could be the way their foot is shaped or they have a lot of forefoot pressure. So we put that pad back in or we do the injection. Yeah, I think what's interesting about the foot and ankle in general is that, you know, A, you know, being a weight bearing and such an important part of our, 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 our gait and, and just our, basically our daily lives where I get around, right, is that there's so many other things that can, you know, either contribute to foot and ankle problems, like you, you, we did touch on diabetes, like right. people can have a lot of foot and ankle or foot issues specifically uh, for, for diabetics. Um, I also think when you relate the spine to the to the lower extremity, a lot of nerve pain. Uh, people that you know me may have just pain, like as you said, on the side of the foot here, and that right. just may be a, a small disc problem in the in the low back. And the foot's actually okay, but the nerve roots in the lower back and the spine are causing this issue. So I think the differential diagnosis of hey, saying is this a true foot problem, right. or is this coming from somewhere else in the body? Um, you know, I think that's really important uh, as a practitioner, and then and then working with your other you know professionals, your physical therapist, your chiropractors, your right. orthopedics, um, you know, even your endocrinologist to kind of manage these these cases with the patients and try and uh, you know let the patient understand and say, hey, you're having foot pain, but you know you have to work on some other things. Correct. We didn't really discuss leg length discrepancy right. or like pelvic shifts or mm -hmm. you know even scoliosis and other things that can cause foot and ankle problems and you know pronation and supination all these other complex more you know biomechanical problems right. that that can occur with the foot and ankle but also related to the rest of the body so if you're doing a an orthotic but they have a you know the a true versus you know, I call acquired, it true, acquired right. you know leg length discrepancy but they truly have like because of an, another injury or they had surgery on their femur for whatever reason when they were younger or a hip problem, a dysplasia issue, you know, they could have an actual true leg length discrepancy and you need to, you know, accommodate for that. So you really, you know, even though you focus on the foot and ankle, you know, you know, really have to assess the entire biomechanical okay. structure, you Every know, time. from, you know, almost from head to toe to make sure that everything's right. aligned properly because it, it is sort of a, a puzzle. Yeah. So that is something that we do pretty commonly um, whenever a patient comes in with this kind of vague foot pain and we don't really know, their x-rays are normal, ultrasounds are normal, we don't really know where it's coming from, we kind of watch them do a gait exam in our office. So we have a hallway, we kind of watch them go back and forth, and like you said, we watch them from head to toe. Is their pelvis shifting in one way or another? Is their knee you know, buckling when they're walking? Do they feel like they're limping on one way or another? And it kind of gives us an idea of why they're having this foot pain. And sometimes we have to refer them out to our, like, our orthopedic colleagues or someone other than that to say, hey, I know you're having foot pain, but this is, there's another problem at hand here. We, a lot of these problems can also be alleviated with orthotics, which is why another reason the gait exams are so important. If they do have something like a limb length or they have surgery elsewhere and it's causing kind of that imbalance, then we can do a orthotic to kind of alleviate that. Sometimes the limb length is so large from a previous surgery, injury, whatever the reason may be, that we kind of have to put an external lift on a shoe, which it kind of becomes a different problem at hand. But again, we have orthotists and other companies that we work with that can kind of make that happen. Okay, so there's been a lot of advanced technology with this. Right. I know, I know, like you said, you were mentioning the plastering and, and the way the orthotics, you know, I know I've had my foot plastered, you know, right. hundreds of times probably. Um, the technology has changed, but uh, in terms of like, you know, weight bearing versus semi weight bearing versus just scanning the foot. I mean, there are variations in the way people apply orthotics. Sure. Do you have a preferred method as to how, you know, you know, the technology is good, but does it take into account all these other things? Right. So I think it's really important to have an orthotic that is basically simulated weight bearing. So the way that we do it in our office, the patient is sitting down, they're not putting weight on it. However, we have kind of a device that holds their foot in a way that is loading the joints of the foot in a certain way that it would be that it's simulating weight bearing. So it kind of offloads the fifth ray of the outside. It kind of puts their subtalar joint, which is the hind foot joint right here, into neutral. That way their foot is completely aligned the way that we would ideally like it to be. Obviously prior to scanning them, we would have done a full exam so we know what their body just rests at. So we kind of try to find a happy medium in between that when we do the orthotic, kind of aligns them appropriately. 
when some people, when they're just standing, their heels can tend to flare out because of that flat foot. But when we simulate it with that device, we kind of get it straight. So we kind of have to figure out what that number difference is and make sure we build it in properly into that orthotic. Okay, so it is, it's a simulated weight-bearing right. activity, to, and then the, the scan will scan at that moment where Correct. that body is being, okay, well, that makes sense, So because you want to yeah. you want to simulate that. So, that's, so that's even with the scan, just it's not used for just orthotics, mm -hmm. some people have something called a drop foot from either an injury or back issue, like you said previously. So there's also AFO braces, which are these more complex braces that are made that kind of go all the way up to the knee that kind of help that patient do that up and down motion that they may not be able to do themselves. So that we kind of use the same technology where we kind of scan their whole leg and it kind of simulates that plaster cast that we used to use before. So that way it's more comfortable, it's a little bit not as thick as our previous devices used to be. It's because a lot of complaints of patients were, yes, the device is great, but it doesn't fit in any shoe. So if you can't use it with the shoe, it's not very useful. So mm -hmm. now hopefully with advancements, right. people are more uh, they're like using them more now. All right. Well, Dr. Shah, I want to thank you very much for uh, joining us today. It was a very uh, informative uh, show about the foot and ankle. Uh, and if anyone would need your services here in Valhalla, New York, uh, I hope they look you up and uh, I hope uh, you have great success. So thank you for having me today. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks for watching Health IQ. Uh, we'll see you at our next show. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.